Welcome to another edition of New Wine Table Talks. Uh, I am Dr. Matt Farlow, and I'm stoked to be here again with Dr. Paul Lewis Mesker, and we are joined with some distinguished uh, guests today for our uh, topic for this episode uh, titled Remove Dividing Walls of Hostility and Indifference. And so like every Thursday, uh, we're going live on Facebook, so we're glad that you're joining us. You have the opportunity at the end of this hour to, for the last 10 minutes or so, to have your own questions asked and answered. Uh, you just put your questions up on our comment board right there on Facebook. Uh, to the right of it. And while you're doing that, that also gives you the opportunity to go right up at the top there and like for our Facebook page, New Wine Facebook page, so that whenever, anytime anything comes up on our Facebook page, you will be notified for that. And you'll see on there the ability for you then to go over to our YouTube page, which after this gets done and gets recorded, we will end up putting it up on our YouTube Facebook page, New Wine, New Wine Skins. And that way below in the description, you'll be able to get to meet each one of our guests today even further through uh, brief bios as well as links to where they are uh, pastoring. So without further ado, I'd like to just, uh, we're stoked to enter into this conversation of open access to one another. Uh, mm -hmm. We are a divided people, uh, but we're also connected people. And so the question we're gonna be asking is really what truth are we going to be living out? And so to dialogue and engage today in the arena, in the subject, the ideas of uh, those things that divide us. And we wanna do so in an open and an equi equitable uh, way. So to begin removing the walls of hostility and indifference in our own minds and hearts bound up with the laws of social segregation and consumer comfort. And so joining Dr. Mesker and I today for our table talks, our pastors, Jeff Harley, uh, Nolani Jai, Jim Sakara, and Jimmy Calhoun. And so before we get into it, just want a brief uh, background for each. Pastor Jeff Harley is pastor of Harem Baptist Church, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he's also the executive director of Call to Serve Community Development Corporation in Philadelphia. And we're happy to have him joining us today. Pastor Nolani Jai is formerly a family law attorney who, with her husband in 2018, began Jesus House Out of Hope Chapel, Huntington Beach, where she is currently the pastor. And so we're stoked to have her here today as well. And Pastor Jim Sakara is the pastor of Cascade View Covenant Church, ordained through the Evangelical Covenant Church, while he also serves at the conference and denominational level in the Covenant's Department of Compassion, Mercy, and Justice. Welcome, Pastor Jim. And finally, we have Pastor Jimmy Calhoun, who is an author, ethicist, and musician. Ordained in the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel, Jimmy has served as a pastor at churches in Los Angeles, Delray Beach, Florida, Maryland, Austin, Texas, and Belize, Central America. Currently serves as pastor of Bridging Austin. Welcome, uh, Pastor Jimmy. And so before we get into this, I wanna just move our discussion over to Paul for his thoughts concerning the walls built today. And so for our viewing audience, uh, you'll see up in the comments section, I'm gonna post a link of what Dr. Metzger will be reading. So for those of you that want to read along, uh, you can do so and to be able to formulate your own questions uh, afterwards after each of our pastors are able to uh, give their own feedback as well. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Uh, thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks, Jeff and Noelani and Jim and Jimmy. Uh, dear friends and colleagues and ministry partners for many years, grateful for each of you and uh, for all those who are joining us live today. And so the reflection that we're uh, dealing with today is related to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Uh, feel free to look at that passage as we go. Uh, and it's titled, Removing Dividing Walls of Hostility and Indifference. Ephesians 2, 11 to 12 features the church as a community made up of Jews and Gentiles. That includes everyone through faith in Christ. Paul writes of how the triune God has removed the dividing wall of hostility involving certain applications of the law that function to polarize the two groups. Through Christ, the two have been brought together as one new humanity. We find that in verse 15 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. Fellow citizens of his kingdom, members of his household, chapter 2, 19, and temple parts or participants 
chapter 2, verse 21. And I'm going to read from this text, chapter 2, 11 through 22 of Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called, quote unquote, the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the divining wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him also you were being built, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. One of the things that comes through to me from this text is that Paul didn't make it happen. The Apostle Paul didn't make it happen. Rather, God did. As Paul writes, chapter 2, verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The new humanity is God's household in which Jesus is the cornerstone and in whom God dwells by his spirit, all of which are found in this passage. Even though God made and makes it happen, we still have a choice as to whether we are going to live as one or try kicking one another out or living in isolated quarters. That's something that uh, Pastor Jimmy and I have discussed at various points along the way, uh, the whole theme of social segregation that we so often have in our society. Paul encourages us and challenges us to live into who we are as one humanity, one body, one household, and one temple. In Paul's day, certain interpretations and applications of the law served to ostracize Gentiles. It was not that the law itself was done away with by Jesus, but the written code or letter of the law. New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce writes, it is not the law as a revelation of the character and will of God that has been done away with in Christ. The righteousness required by the law of God is realized more fully by the inward enabling of the spirit in Jew and Gentile alike that was possible under, then was possible under the old covenant. Bruce goes on, but the law is a written code. Threatening death instead of imparting life is done away with in Christ. This is in his commentary on Ephesians. Going on, we have laws that isolate and otherize us today. It might not be a visible or explicit laws of religious legalism or slavery, segregation, and redlining. They could simply be laws of social segregation that allow us to stay entrenched in our respective domains of confirmation bias, conservative and liberal forms of identity politics, and consumer comfort zones, which keep us from realizing our emancipation and full equality in Christ. Often such laws as separation involve a sense of superiority. In the biblical context involving Jews and Gentiles, whether the wall of hostility was the barrier that divided the court of the Jews from the court of the Gentiles in the temple where the law is a written code, the fundamental problem, according to Bruce, was ultimately psychological. And that's key for where we're going today, psychological. Often a sense of superiority bound up with separateness. Bruce writes, and I quote him again, the barrier between Jews and Gentiles was largely a psychological barrier. The antipathy aroused by the separateness of the Jews 
accompanying as it often was by a sense of superiority on their part in the New Testament context. But this antipathy, it is affirmed, has been abolished by Christ, the Jewish Jesus, in his flesh, that is by his death. How? Because by his death, he has done away with that which separated the Jews from the Gentiles, the law of commandments, ordinances, and all, unquote. Certainly, this sense of superiority went both ways, I believe, between Jewish and Gentile people in the early church with their divisions, one group looking down on the other. And we can have that same thing going on today, many of us who are Gentiles operating amongst other Gentiles as well, not simply with Jewish people. We need to remember who we were before Christ and what Christ has since made us. Amen. May no sense of superiority or inferiority lead us to segregate from one another. We need to live into the reality of our new humanity in Christ and not allow such name, uh, dynamics as racial bigotry and social segregation to make us hostile and indifferent to one another. We should note that just as with Jews and Gentiles, the sense of superiority or inferiority is bound up with spiritual reality for we are one humanity in Christ. Similarly, we are not separate biologically. Here too, what we take to be genetic or biological differences between whites and blacks, for example, as supposed quote unquote races are really social and psychological constructs. Just today at New Wine, we posted uh, the preview of an episode, our latest episode of New Wine Tastings featuring uh, scientists Augustine Fuentes at Princeton and Josh Swamidas, that's Joshua Swamidas uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. And they're arguing against that idea that race um, is biological. It's really a psychological construct. Here's what Fuentes discusses uh, in his recent article, or, or in an article rather, um, titled Busting Myths About Human Nature. He's an anthropologist, uh, anthropologist. Here are a few of the points Fuentes makes, and I quote, in humans today, there are not multiple biological groups called races. However, race is real and it impacts us all. What we call race are social categories, Fuentes says. He goes on, there is currently one biological race in our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. However, that does not mean that what we call races, that is our society's ways of dividing people up, don't exist. Societies like the US construct racial classifications, not as units of biology, but as ways to lump together groups of people with varying historical, linguistic, ethnic, religious, or other backgrounds. These categories are not static, Fuentes argues. They change over time as societies grow, diversify, and alter their social, political, and historical makeups. For example, in the US, the Irish were not always white. And despite our government's legal definition, most Hispanics, Latinos, Fuentes argues, are not seen as white today by themselves or by others. Lastly, he argues, the biological racial fallacy influences people to see racism and inequality not as the products of economic, social, and political histories, but more as a natural state of affairs, which ultimately proves disastrous to how we engage one another in our society. Maybe we'll have a chance to engage that theme later and the import of that problematic notion. Going on, just as there is only one biological species to which all humans belong, namely Homo sapiens sapiens, so we who trust in Christ are all one new humanity in him, according Amen. to Paul. Paul encourages us to remember who we were before Christ and who we are now in Christ. Elsewhere, Paul encourages us to accept one another then as Christ has accepted us Romans 15, 7, to put on love and empathy, Colossians 3, 14 to 17, and to consider others better than ourselves, 
because of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit's exemplary care for us, as shown in Ephesians 2, 1 to 11. Let's take time to remember where we come from, what God has done for us, and who we are as one new humanity in and through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. That doesn't mean we discount our differences or our cultural, historical, linguistic particularity. No, we celebrate them and we account for them in their richness and in their fullness. Let us accept one another, put on love and empathy, and consider others better than ourselves in view of God's care. Instead of reacting, let's respond. Instead of speaking first, let's listen. Let's try and step inside one another's shoes, especially those who haven't had shoes, boots, or bootstraps. Wow. One African-American bishop said in Portland, in response to the dismissive remark that the African-American community needs to pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, he said, then give me some bootstraps. Also, I would add, release the chokehold and remove the knee from the collective neck. Let's try to see one another not as other than us, but as one with us in solidarity in our distinctive particularity. Let's remove the walls of hostility and indifference that we create and instead live into our new humanity in Christ. We truly will all be better for it. A few specific items come into play at this point related to what I wrote above and how it bears on the present day cultural tumult. Instead of immediately reacting as a white person, for example, as myself or others, when we hear black lives matter by saying all lives matter, let's first ask ourselves pointedly, to what extent have African-American lives really mattered to the rest of us? Someone reached out to me and said, okay, Paul, is it the Black Lives Matter movement or simply Black Lives Matter? Of course, Black Lives Matter, but are you talking about the movement? And the question I would ask of myself and I'd ask of anyone else in my subculture is, to what extent has a particular African-American really truly mattered to me and not just simply as you know, uh, a bumper sticker, so to speak. And I'm not talking about Black Lives Matter movement. I'm talking about just like, well, I love all people. Well, do I actually know particular people, particular individuals Mm -hmm. and share life with them? Are we concerned about social inequities involving education, employment, healthcare, law enforcement, and imprisonment? Michelle Alexander's book, some viewers will know about that with the new Jim Crow talks about the disparities in the prison systems, and that is in our healthcare systems and our educational systems and the like. And so often, historically into the present time, and some of the respondents might address this as well, racial dynamics and economic disparities often play off of one another in our society. And Dr. King's famous sermon, Beyond Vietnam, which is really the sermon that we need to account for today, He talks about the triad of economic exploitation, racism, and militarism, and we need to own that. It's more a problem today than it was April 4th, 1967, when he first uttered those words. How has such concern shaped our lives, our daily lives, relationships, and how we live, and where we live? Instead of quickly raising questions about the Black Lives Matter platform, or the movement's entire platform, ask ourselves whether we have embraced candidates and voted for people in flat platforms, not because of their entire package, but because of certain key aspects of their political agendas. In other words, in my own particular subgrouping, uh, in terms of evangelical Christianity, I hear these kinds of statements made, but I'm thinking I know people all the time who choose certain aspects of a candidate's agenda and affirm that even though they discount most everything else about that candidate. And we don't throw that out, do we, so often in our context when that is the case. We need to be consistent in terms of our affirmations and our critiques, myself included. And for those who say that the church, and I hear this a lot, should not be political or discuss these matters, consider how often such dismissals simply serve as cover for us not to bring our faith to bear honestly and openly into view of our own various patterns, voting patterns, and decisions. We are all political. The question is, 
to what extent the politics of Jesus's kingdom impacts every aspect of our personal and public lives. To the extent we are able to engage in conversations today in our church communities on such subjects in this open and equitable way, at least that's what we're seeking to move toward, and I still have a long way to go in terms of moving toward it. To that extent, we can begin moving to remove the walls of hostility and indifference. In places like Portland, you know, everyone is tolerant, and yet tolerance can itself be a form of indifference. Amen. How are we doing in removing the walls of hostility, of segregation, indifference, in our minds and hearts bound up with consumer comfort and the like? To that extent, and to that extent that we remember, to the extent that we remember that we, what we were before Christ and who we are together in Christ, we can live into our new humanity as the church in our multi-ethnic society. The honest, heartfelt, and equitable questions and conversations called for above must continue on and beyond the passing heated cultural moment had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Leroy Haynes Jr., Lisa Sharon Harper, and Tom Crademaker this last week, and we posted at New Wine Tastings on how to move from the sprint to the marathon race for justice that Dr. Haynes has talked about in a book that he wrote. Otherwise, indifference and hostility will easily reemerge due to social isolation. Just as we have ongoing access through Christ in the spirit to the Father, let's keep open access to one another mm. as the new humanity over the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. Right. The new wineskins, we seek to be stretched by the new wine of Christ and not to become brittle and to learn how to repent daily into this reality that God has set forth for us in Christ through the spirit in removing the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile and between Gentile and Gentile of different types of social isolation to make us truly one. So thank you for joining us. And now we look to our colleagues to take the conversation deeper in whichever ways they choose to go. Dr. Mesker, I'd love to address um, Bruce, um, Bruce's comment that the, the part of your blog post that really resonated um, most with me, I think, was his his section on the psychological barrier um, being because I was really questioning when this all happened with George Floyd. Um, what is the dividing wall of hostility? I preached on that passage um, that week. Um, what is the wall of hostility? And and while it is um, antipathy and and downright hostility in some cases, I think in more cases. It's um, and superiority, and I think in more cases it's apathy and indifference. And and when you wrote that, that really resonated with me. And so I mean, and I I come from I'm a native Hawaiian, so I come from a people group who had our country taken from us. Um, but I'm mindful that we have a people group in our country, the United States, who who were taken from their country, and so. Um, I, I thought I was woke, as my millennials have taught me that term, thought I was woke. Um, but when George Floyd's murder happened on television, frankly, I have been avoiding a whole lot of news. Um, the pandemic is exhausting, um, but I'm glad I caught it. And um, as hard as it was to watch, um, the part that really jumped out for me, I'm a mom, so I definitely... Um, resonated with his call for his mom and his gasp for air, request for air, but he referred to the man killing him as officer. And, and um, that struck me. And so I did comment on social media the next day. We don't always comment on things as pastors. We expend some of our pastoral capital if we comment on everything um, out there, but this needed to be said. And, and that really struck me that he would in his dying moments have been so trained to show respect for a person who was killing him. And um, that was where my comment went on social media. But a couple days later was Pentecost and we were having a, 
a church service. Um, we had not gathered in person. We were for months, but we were going to try to do a drive-in and just be in our cars and do a graduation for about 22 students who weren't having graduations. And um, we we're going to have a Holy Spirit baptism because we're Pentecostal. And I, I really kind of did what I normally do. I think that the wall of hostility for me is more indifference and apathy. And so I compartmentalized what happened with my post and went on planning for our service that Friday night and had our service. And uh, the next morning, Saturday morning, I have a regular phone um, meeting with our worship director. He's a wonderful young man, African-American man, who's a student at our Bible university in Foursquare, within Foursquare. And um, we have a good working and relationship and growing friendship. And he let me know immediately in the conversation, because that's how we do it. Um, he said, I'm not doing well today. Um, I said, why? And he said, because last night, um, Jesus House did not feel like my church. As his friend and as his pastor, that broke my heart. Um, I could come up with all those reasons for why we didn't talk about George Floyd the night before, but we didn't. I didn't even refer to him in prayer. And so um, he proceeded. I asked him why he felt that way, and he let me know his own experiences in growing up, his family's experiences, particularly his dad and brother's, um, with regards to um, interactions with the police. And he explained why he wouldn't even necessarily um, go to um, anywhere, go out anywhere on a Friday night. Now we're a Friday night church. And not only that, we meet in a parking lot. And so he, he takes risks. And I didn't know that. I didn't understand that until that morning, the next morning, that to be a part of, to be the worship director at our church, he's um, going to a parking lot on a Friday night and that his drive home is risky for him. And so in that moment, his burden became my burden. And for me personally as a pastor, and what I then preached that next Friday is that um, even though it's not my experience, my experience is more of an, as a native, um, an indigenous person here in the United States, um, his burden is now my burden because he's my brother. And while the wall was not hostility for me, it, it was apathy. It no longer is. It can no longer be um, apathy. It's not my reality. It's his, but now it is my reality and it's my burden. And I'm mindful and I pray more along the lines of what, what his wife shared with me later that week when we had a Zoom call with all of our leadership and the two of them, and, and she shared, she does not pray that he would have traveling mercy <laughs> to get home. She prays he'll, he will live when he leaves in the morning, that he will make it home alive. And so um, my prayer is that this psychological barrier will, will begin to be broken down. This dividing wall will begin to come down when we share burdens, when we do the biblical call to bear one another's burdens um, out of love and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And so that's just my yeah, personal recent experience <laughs> and why your blog post resonated so strongly. Well, thank you, me. Pastor Jai. I really appreciate uh, your reflections and taking it deeper into our current contexts and life situations. Amen. Is it Pastor Harley who's going to share next? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I, uh, I'm going to say something about what Pastor Jai said, because uh, I like that, where she said apathy. And I learned recently that the opposite of love is not hate, but it's apathy. Because apathy, you don't have any emotion involved at all, but at least hate, there's emotion involved. You're, you're involved with it. And so even how she took it to like, she brought it into the ecclesia and the worship. And when I listened to your post, listened to you read it and reading it myself, at least six to eight, maybe nine times, you talk about the new, you said the new humanity is God's household. Paul challenges us to live into who we are. You kept saying how living the challenge is to live as the new creation, you know, in the earth. And so 
I think like if I could, if I was to preach this or something, I would say uh, identity theft. And when you know who you are, you can go far. Because really in the body of Christ, we don't know who we are. Because, you know, when we talk about, like, I, I appreciate uh, what the, uh, the anthropologist said, but uh, I could have just taken him to Acts 17, 26, where God says, from one person, God made all the nations who live on the earth. And he decided when and where every nation would be born. So there goes the race conversation right there for me. But from the Ephesians 2, what I love is it says, in Christ, he made a new creation. So when we look at 1 Corinthians 10 and 32, right? Paul says, and we can miss this if we read it too fast, but he says, don't cause problems for Jews or Gentiles or anyone who belongs to the church of God. Mm -hmm. So you had, in their day, you had two races, if you will. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. If you were a Gentile, you weren't a Jew. If you were a Jew, you weren't a Gentile. But then Jesus comes and makes this whole new species through the resurrection, the new creation. The, the, the Christians in the first and second, third centuries, they called themselves the third race, the new species. And that's what that says in that text. When that says new, that means something that never existed before. Right. And that's who we are, yeah. right? And so we're this new creation. Now, take that, any species. Take like, I don't know, a polar bear in the Antarctica, right? And you put him in the Florida Keys. If he survives, he won't be able to reproduce. Why? Because he's not in his right habitat to grow, to develop, to flourish, right? So we're a new species, and the ecclesia is to be a divine habitat where we can disciple people to develop into this new creature that they are, but they have had identity theft. Mm. And when you know who you are, you can go far. Mm. In the Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ in the beginning, it was a classless society. It had no social status. It had no color, no position. Read Philemon and the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. What I like in the, in the church is they didn't say, like it said Paul from Tarsus, but they just used their first names. Because if you use your last name, that could, that could trace you back to a certain class or socioeconomic position. But now that we're the new species, I'm Jeff, you're Paul, right? Jimmy, Jim, you know, Nolani. Right, Matt, right, why? Because we're all in Christ. And it goes to the extent that Paul rebukes Peter. Uh, what we would say in the hood was like, Peter was perpetrating a fraud. He was like eating with the Gentiles when the Jews weren't around. When the Jews came around, he's like, I ain't hanging with them. Paul's like, nah, that doesn't work. We're new creation. We're all the same in Christ. And so what I believe, you know, in those dividing walls and that is, the disciple that's produced is going to be a, a, a product of the gospel that's preached to them. Okay. And so I'm just going to be, I'm straight up like this, right? It's like this. The gospel that's preached today is not deep enough to drown a flea. Just bottom line. Because if the disciples that are being produced don't know who they are, then that's okay. our fault for not showing right. them in the scripture. We should be preaching showing them who Christ is, showing them who we are in, because of Christ, and now how we live. Just like you said in the text, he starts out by saying, you know, we were a part of, you know, that we formerly lived according to our own lusts and according to the power of, you know, the God of this air, Satan, but God, hmm. and then now we're this. And, hmm. and that's the piece there. Because if we, as a foretaste of what what the global Eden will look like when Christ reigns. If we show that as a foretaste, then they will say, look at the love they have for one another. Jesus will say, I know they're my disciples. Look at their love for one another. And then in his prayer in John 17, the world will know that the Father sent him. But until we get to who we are and live that out, we can't even begin to think about dealing with the political, economic, and systems which, by the way, are the systems of this world, which God has already condemned. God has already judged the old creation. So I don't try to go out of my way to fix those systems because Galatians 1, you know, Paul's my favorite. Christ died to do what? Deliver us from this evil world system. 
So I'm not a part of the world system. I cut myself off from the world system. But then we get a band of brothers and sisters together in the ecclesia, and we attack that system and try to help those who are being oppressed, who are being marginalized, and who are being underserved because of Satan, because they're being held as spiritual hostages, and get them released, like the Raid on Entebbe, one of my favorite movies, get them released out of that situation, then teach them who they are and that they know their real identity because when you know who you are, you can go far. And I think my five minutes is up because I feel Amen. this thing. You know, I Amen. really love it. You know, Amen, the Pastor Jeff. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Who, who wishes to go next, uh, Pastor Jim or Pastor Jimmy? Well, let, well, I'll let my kapuna speak last and have the last word. How's that, Jimmy? <laughs> you know, um, I really, you know, Phil, I mean, Paul, what I really appreciate about reading your article was um, the questions it ra raises for me. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, and, and um, Brother Jeffrey talked about this, but, you know, this, this new humanity. And I think the question for me is who gets to define the new humanity? I mean, who is it that says, you know, you are new in Christ now. This is what it looks like. And so... It's challenging for me because, um, you know, for for a buddy of mine who asked Jesus into his life, um, prayed the prayer, asked Jesus into his life, and a pastor told him, you know what, you're not you're not Hawaiian anymore. You're a Christian. Um, that becomes an issue. Um, uh, as a pastor, I would sit with our kapunas. No, Lani knows our kapunas are aunties and uncles, and they're the ones with wisdom. And I remember sitting around a table with some uncles, and um, and the uncles asked me. They said, Hey, pastor, so how does our um, how does our Christianity and our Hawaiian-ness match up? And I say that because growing up, we had um, what, what most, most Christians called superstitions, but those were part of our stories. That was part of our life. Mm -hmm. and as, as a Christian, I, I mean, when I became a Christian, I had, I, I had an identity crisis because what I believed really didn't make me a full-on Christian because of what I was told and what I was you know, meant, you know, told to believe and all that. And so, um, the challenge becomes for me, I think, is, you know, who gets to define that? Who gets to say, this is what the new humanity looks like in Christ? Um, and so that, you know, that, that raises, you know, that raises the question, because when we talk about a new humanity in Christ, um, unless we have conversations with um, our brothers, of, uh, brothers and sisters of color, especially African Americans, their new humanity is totally different than what a white new humanity is, especially under the oppression and, and everything and the struggles that you, you face. And so, you know, that I think is one of the challenges. And I think that comes by having these conversations with other cultures, with other, you know, people groups to hear what their story is. Because I think they're, I think our God is bigger than just the white. <laughs> you know, the white um, uh, missionary, and, and I, I want to be careful because missionaries, while they, they did some um, harm, you know, they, they did do some good as well. Um, but I think about, you know, when we talk, even going back to the doctrine of discovery, I mean, that, that becomes the standard of what Christianity is. You come in and you say, well, this doesn't look Christian to me. We're going to take the land. And so that's part of, you know, that's this part of our culture. And so you know, one is, you know, having these discussions, what, you know, and, and maybe it's not necessarily saying this is what the new humanity looks like, or the, you know, new person in Christ, but maybe we, the discussion becomes, this is the broadness of our, of, of what Christ is and who he is in the discussions with other cultures. And, and the other piece is how much, how much room do we have? I mean, how much, whose stories are we willing to listen to as well? And I, and I don't want to just say crazy off the wall stories, but staying biblical, staying within God's word, within that context, um, and so one of, you know, one of the questions is, or one of the challenges is, how do we define that? Um, you know, the, other, the second thing um, uh, that you brought up was just how do we have the conversations? And I think for me, it's about relationships, yeah. about developing the relationships with people. I think, um, you know, for me, it's, um, it's relationships versus cause. For some people, this, um, the Black Lives Matter. So what I, when I shared in our church why it hurt me so badly when I saw um, uh, George, you know, having the knee on, on, on uh, or the officer having the knee on his head. I said, what, what bothered me the most was that that could have been my friend, David or Henry Greenidge. That could have been my, and I, and I could name people who that could have happened to. And I think what, what's important is we have these discussions is that um, it's about relationships. We need to develop relationships so that we're not just having a cause. We're not just showing up for something because, hey, everybody else is doing it. The Christians are doing it. My church is doing it. So I better do it. 
but we're showing up because of the relationships and the people that we have, the people that are experiencing the injustices. And so I think that that's part of this, um, the discussion and also what you brought up. Um, it's, it's coming to the table. I mean, it's having hard discussions. And, and the thing about the race relationships, it's hard work and it's messy work. And I think um, the challenge is, is that, that um, our, our brothers and sisters, and I think, you know, I mean, we talk about, you know, the Black Lives Matter, but I see it going back to, to our Native American brothers and sisters. And, you know, we talked about, um, you know, Nolani, we've had our land taken, right? I mean, it was, it was literally taken. And then we have brothers here who was brought to a land. I mean, they were basically kidnapped and taken away from home, but also we have people on this land um, who are our hosts and had that taken away from them. And so how do we, you know, you know work through those kind of things? But I think it's, it's hard conversations. It's staying at the table. Um, uh, a friend of ours popped in, Jimmy, um, Randy Woodley. And one of the things he says, he talks about civility and civility is um, staying in the table. Civility isn't having quiet conversations. Sometimes civility means pounding at the tables, yelling, and, but, but civility says we stay at the table. We stay at the table and we don't get up and leave. And so I think, you know, those are some of the things that I see as far as, you know, the new, new humanity and how do we further, you know, further the conversation. You know, I know for myself um, as a native Hawaiian, um, I need to be at these tables. I, I, need, I need to continue to hear what my African-American brothers and sisters are saying. I need to hear what my Native American and my Hispanic brothers are saying. And so, you know, it's not just, it, it's, it's for all of us, but we're all here to learn together. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. And just as you were saying, you know, Nolani said about her worship minister, uh, you know, they have a friendship and that, that brings her in. And I think, our friendships, Henry and David Greenwich, and friendships here on this on this uh, screen, um, it, it changes the dynamics. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy. Yeah, well, uh, as I heard and as I I read actually the title, uh, "Dividing Walls," I immediately thought about what a wall really is metaphorically, or in actuality, you know, like the Berlin Wall a few years ago. And the president of the United States says, tear down that wall. And I thought, well, walls are easy to tear down. They're material substance, and you can manipulate it and make it go away. But I thought about uh, the boundaries that separate us, the mm -hmm. attitudinal boundaries. Those are a little bit different. They're a little bit harder to make go away that when I define attitude, I'm talking about a settled way of thinking. Just that, that way you th that you don't really have to, to make an effort to have a thought come into your head, just the way you live every single day. Mm -hmm. Like I've always been in music and sports and that requires that you develop a pattern. You, you exercise every day, you exercise your hands and over a period of time, everything comes second nature to you. And so that's the type of attitude that comes, that I'm talking about, it comes second nature. For example, we were in a, a, a uh, rent-a-car place and my wife, who is white, we walked up to the counter and the receptionist says, uh, the, the, the employee says, well, do you need uh, extra coverage for that person? Pointed to Julaine. And Julian says, well, I'm his wife. And she goes, oh, you are? And she responded, why shouldn't uh, I be married to him? And when she said that, a white gentleman sitting in a chair inserted himself into the conversation. He goes, oh, that's not fair. She's just trying to cover, you know, she wants to make sure the insurance. Why did he do that? Why did he feel that it was okay for him to insert himself into a business transaction that he had no part of hmm. because he had this attitude that hmm. the space belonged to him. Hmm. I was but a visitor. Hmm. The space was his. And my boundary was not to infringe upon um, the white receptionist, but to whatever she said goes, and that's the way the game is supposed to be played. Those type of boundaries are difficult to overcome because they're invisible. We don't see them. Mm -hmm. Everybody just thinks and 
operates like there's certain understanding. You don't think black, you don't act black. Or if you're black, you don't think white, don't act white. Except that there's always a bleeding over of boundaries and to demonstrate that it's possible. Rap comes on the scene and the average white person says, oh, I don't listen to that rap crap. Then a short while later, here comes Eminem outselling everybody. So the rap crap all of a sudden became good crap just by who was doing it. A boundary had been broken musically without people thinking about it cognitively or consciously. Mm-hmm. So it's those attitudinal things, that, those boundaries that we all experience, that we even take part in setting up. Mm-hmm. We go along with them and saying, I better not cross that. Just like I know I can't get on a plane and go over to England and land and say, I'm here. There's a boundary. There's no, there's no wall, but there's an understanding. Engb- England belongs to the Brits. And America is where I belong. America owns me, the Brits own them. And those boundaries we respect. But there are attitudinal boundaries that prevent us from coming together and being a people as one That's right. that we don't pay attention to. We just go along every day thinking the way we think and try to attack things item by item. So I, I think that wall is, needs to come down and I think we need to expand our boundaries and be aware that they exist and widen them and maybe even erase them. I think all of those are a possibility. And my second point is friendships are important as well. And what we strive for at Bridging is intimacies. We want to take it one step farther than friendships. You, there's all kinds of friendships with intimacies to the point where you know people's family, their extended family, you know their grandfather, you know what's going on with the the old uncle in um, Portland. (laughs) You know know a lot about that family. Just don't show up and have an affinity group or a relationship around something you're mutually interested in. You get deeply involved. One of our uh, friends, Robert and Francois, they they flew all the way over to England to, to have a a time of watching a soccer match. One's white and one's black and the mom is Vietnamese. So we have these people, their lives are enmeshed, they're they're intertwined, they do everything together as though it's natural, Mm -hmm. as though there are no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, (laughs) it's an image and it's also a metaphor for what's possible. We can live a life without boundaries, Mm -hmm. but it starts in our attitude, not what we think, but what we just accept, mm. how we live every day without thinking. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy. Um, uh, these are such rich reflections and uh, so much each one of you has shared that uh, takes us deeper into the conversation as friends, as, as colleagues. And I think, Matt, you're going to uh, uh, include others in the conversation now if there are any comments uh, for us? If not, we'll ask one another to keep processing what what has been shared amongst ourselves. So do you have anyone, Matt? Yeah, one of the one question that came about uh, through via email and some direct messaging was uh, directly related to um, a tweet that went out from the President of the United States. And a lot of people might read the tweet and not even see anything wrong with it because it's not explicit. And yet some would say that it is an explicit, uh, some have called it a whistle, dog whistle, uh, about the American suburban lifestyle. So this is what the tweet said. He said, I am happy to inform all the people living their suburban lifestyle dream that you will no longer be bothered or financially hurt by having low income housing built in your neighborhood. Your housing prices will go up based on the market and crime will go down. I have rescinded the Obama-Biden Affordable uh, Fair Housing Act rule. Enjoy, he said AFFH. And so a lot of people would, there's a group of people, primarily probably maybe from the uh, white evangelical church that might not see, oh great, like low-income housing could have its own place and that won't bring down our home uh, uh, prices. And yet it's a dividing wall. And so the question is, is how, 
would, how do we engage with that kind of mentality uh, when others might read this tweet and not see anything wrong with it, not see any hostility, not s- because of going back to Pastor Nalani's point, maybe they're apathetic, maybe they're, there's just an exceptional indifference to where they don't even, that tweet doesn't even make them perk up, where others would see it and, and talk about, oh, uh, this is a form of gentrification and there's a exceptional cultural blindness if people can see that, hear that tweet from the president of the United States and not be an alarmed. Uh, so how does that play into, or would you say, see that playing into the idea of further dividing between races or economic uh, structure? Thoughts from others? I would like to just, just interject that, um... Last week, I was talking with Philadelphia Gospel Movement, and a young lady was sharing about um, this movie or or this uh, curriculum called The Color Compromise. I've never seen it, but the thought that she shared from it that resonated with me was um, that when you looked at slavery, right? So let's take Thomas Jefferson's wife. Uh, She had to know that he was raping the Black slave women so you could have more slaves. So he did it for economic reason. Well, the wife had to compromise knowing that her husband was doing that. So call a compromise. And so he's compromising for economic reasons. Well, in the same, in the same uh, kind of with that tweet, and I haven't seen it, if you're saying low income, as Jimmy was saying, just some things like that come in our minds as attitudinal that when we think of low income, and this is has a lot to do with TV and movies too, of who's portrayed as low income, because then he said less crime. So right there, if you watch Law and Order, you watch any of these shows on TV, is a young black guy around the neighborhood that I'm in, <laughs> uh, you know, in our church. And so it's like, this person won't be moving out there to you and you will have more income because the value of your home will be better. And if you're a believer in Christ and you're supposed to be this new humanity, if you accept that, then you're compromising who you are, you know, in the Lord. And so I think like, like we're having these, because this conversation is like awesome because I never put together the thought. I knew that uh, uh, Hawaii was taken from the Hawaiians. I knew that, but I never put it like your land was taken from you and African Americans were taken from our land. So I'm definitely running with that. And then like, like Jimmy said, you know, those boundaries, like in our mind, so a person just reads that and like uh, Matt said, you know, they're a white person. So, oh, this is great. You know, our value of our land will go up, but they're not. So they need somebody else who can come along from another perspective and say, well, hey, this is how I kind of see that and what that kind of speaks to me. And now that we're both sisters and brothers of this new creation, and then, like uh, Pastor Jim said, now let's the, the civility. Let's sit here and like let's flesh that out, and let's yeah. let's brew a pot of coffee and sit up all night till we get it done. So that's my piece with that. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Jeff. Other thoughts in response to the question? Uh, playing on the back of that, and you could uh, any one of you could also answer that as well. But their question comes with long historical legacy of white supremacy in America, injustice has been suffered by uh, black indigenous people of color, the acronym BIPOC, BIPOC, and is now part of our systems. Um, and it go, the question goes on to say, uh, making them uh, systems of oppression. What role should Christians play in restructuring oppressive systems and in making reparations to BIPOC, black indigenous people of color? I think we have to present a different story, um, as Apostle Paul is saying, and as um, Dr. Mesker wrote about um, this um, section in Ephesians, um, we hold um, an alternate story (laughs) in our hands. We hold good news. We hold the ultimate good news. And um, I think for me, a lot of it, and, and maybe the microcosmic example recently for me is is Juneteenth. Um, I did not actually know the story of Juneteenth. Um, my millennials, again, 
awakened me to the story and said, you better talk about it at church because it was a Friday <laughs> and that's when we meet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what I t took away from that was, and especially being native Hawaiian, um, we are story based. We're an oral culture. Um, and we tell stories through hula and through our song and chants. And it, if we don't keep telling these stories, they're going to get lost, right? Our history will be lost. And, and Juneteenth is really an example of how the, the news, the story didn't get to Texas. It didn't get to the people that were slaves and slave owners for four and a half years. Um, and so I think we're in that four and a half year time right now um, as a church where we have a responsibility to keep talking, as we're saying, to keep dialoguing, to have the pot of coffee until we hammer this out. And, and really it is incumbent on the church um, because we have the good news. We have the, the emancipation proclamation ultimately in Jesus and the, the hope that Apostle Paul is referring to of that reconciliation that um, that all that we have harmed, all those we have harmed, BIPOC, all those people we have harmed, um, we can extend our our um, at, we can ask for forgiveness. We can seek true biblical reconciliation in Christ, but we have to do that by continuing to tell the stories and talk. We cannot make this just an Instagram post and then and then move on. It's not enough. Not enough anymore. And I do believe. The pandemic is part of the way we're being quiet enough and connecting enough to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Jai, Pastor Noalani, uh, a lot there. And uh, others want to pick up on, on that with just the histories, learning the histories, learning the stories, as uh, Noalani was sharing. Uh, we don't know history and we tend to repeat it. As Santiana talked about, we if we don't understand it, we repeat it. Um, we need to know Juneteenth. We need to know what's happened with the land. Um, we need to go back to Scripture and think through how does Scripture educate us on these matters. I think we'd be surprised to see how much the Scriptures engage land and uh, displacement from land. Uh, Willie Jennings, theologian at Yale, has talked about how we need to account for that um, place and land. And so often we have a very uh, Gnosticized gospel in American evangelical Christianity. It's just about the spirit, and we don't see it about the body and the land. And it, shalom it's is all about everything. And uh, so is Zacchaeus. And then we'll open it up to others. But, you know, Zacchaeus, we just got into this with Dr. Haynes and Lisa Sharon Harper and Tom Crademaker last week. You know, Zacchaeus, this chief tax collector. We all know the little story about we little man, we little man was he. And But, you know, the real punchline is what I find at the end where, you know, and it's like haunting words. He says, I'm going to give back up to four times what I've taken. Right. And Jesus then says, not with the four spiritual laws, not to bash the four spiritual laws, but there's more to it. Uh, they're holistic laws. Um, uh, it says, now salvation has come to this household because of the holistic repentance mm -hmm. and um it's a it's a daily grinding repentance it mm -hmm. can't be a hashtag it can't be um instagram it has to be ongoing not just in the instant as right. noelani was saying jim and jimmy do you have thoughts on this or do we want to take other questions to take it further you know i, I think what i was going to add as far as you know because it was in the context within the the christian church i think is being able to have people of color represented in the, in the discussion. When it comes to discussions of reparations and things like that, um, you know, other than having people of color um, to be in these, in the church discussing these things as a, more than a token, but I think, you know, having opportunities to really have a voice, a place to, you know, a place to tell our stories, mm -hmm. um, a place to where we don't have to defend our stories, because a lot of times when we're in a culture, you know, in the white context, we start to tell our stories and people say, you know, I mean, I have a brother that, um, a friend that bought, an African-American bought a house. Um, the, the sellers just happened to see that he was black and, and changed their mind. I mean, it's that whole gentrification. It was in, in Northeast Portland. Um, and they decided to, you know, to pull, you know, to pull back or to, to, to remove the, the offer from them. And so we need to be in a context where people are willing to listen to the story and say, you know what, this, this could be true. 
Because I know for myself, um, especially in, in racial um, righteousness conversations, half the battle is trying to convince um, our white folk that, that these really are happening to us. And so I think part of it is being in a, being in a situation where we don't have to defend ourselves because that's tiring. Okay. But to be able to be with you know, other brothers and sisters that say, you know what, we believe your story. We believe that this is injustice and then we can move from there. But I think that's part of the, you know, the systems of, you know, because they're so ingrained with just the white power mm -hmm. and, you know, and those pieces. I think having people of color being able to share their story mm -hmm. and having people listen, say, you know what, I, I believe your story. So. Mm -hmm. Amen. I just, can, Amen. I just say that when, when COVID-19 hit, and you talk about those systems, we already were trying in our church to get some type of health clinic because we already knew that the community that we serve in in Philadelphia that um, people have no insurance or they're underinsured. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no jobs and there's no hope. And we look at ourselves as purveyors of hope. So we knew that. So back in March, we already started making a plan to try to get food to people because mm -hmm. we knew that about 65 to 70% of the food that kids got was when they went to school. So when they shut school down, they mm -hmm. weren't going to get food. And so, they started giving out food at the schools, but then people were standing in line on top of one another without masks. So mm -hmm. this is, for me, was like, okay, it's new creation. You know, Jesus fed people. So let's, let's feed them. Let's, let's, we already had a soup kitchen. We were like, we got to get groceries. And, you know, one of the things that when in relationships, having a relationship with Temple University here in Philly and with the Center for Urban Bioethics was they were like, Jeff, how can we come along and help you all? And since then, they've spent close to half a million dollars. Wow. We've been feeding like 1,400 households every week. And that's just in like a, a 10 to 15 block area. And we got to create jobs because then people didn't have jobs. We needed two drivers in mm -hmm. a van and then people to pack the food, people to take who's getting what. Is it a family? So now we can be able to create jobs out of that. And now we're trying to train people for telemed jobs and for contact tracing jobs. But now the other piece that we're working on is, okay, they're not having school, they're safe, but 72% of the children in our community don't have internet service. We take that for granted, mm -hmm. you know? And so we're trying to get internet service. And mm -hmm. my thing is when I worked for a labor union and back when President Obama was back in the two, early 2000s and we were pushing for healthcare for everybody, right? My stance was if you're poor and you need a lawyer, don't they give you a lawyer? So if I'm sick, shouldn't they give me a doctor? And if I'm hungry, shouldn't I get some food? And so if I need the internet to do certain things, then it's a public property. It should be like available to people to get. And so we're trying to get that because how are the students going to learn if they don't get that? And some mm -hmm. of the things that certain people that we take for granted, a lot of other people don't have, and therefore they don't have hope. And then crime can come out of that. So when we start hearing like those, that's why I'm glad you gave me a space to tell that story because people need to know that story because what I found out as people hear that story now, and Dr. Mesker would love me for this because I love how he crosses all lines, is um, one of the Catholic di dioceses in our suburbs reached out to me and said, Jeff, we want to partner and, and help you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. You don't have any problem with that. I'm like, I, I don't know how to do, but I'm good. <laughs> you guys do good. And so they asked me to come and speak at a vigil they're having called Equality, Justice, and Hope. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm glad. Let's do this. And they're in a suburb, and they're predominantly white. And I'm loving that, mm -hmm. that God is doing that. So you know, I just wanted to share that along with that Amen. there. That he has Amen. that third race after going, you know, some of those systems are going to be you know, have inequality are going to be oppressive, but we come and take the burden because we know how to give our burdens to him. Amen. 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 Let me let Jimmy and Jim talk. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, you haven't shared anything in the last few minutes. Well, I, I just, uh, I guess I could chime in on reparations because that was a topic I just discussed with a, a really close Jewish friend of mine over the weekend. And uh, we were, we were talking about teshuva, this, this idea of one way of looking at repentance is that you, like Alcoholics Anonymous, you do your best to make amends. It's not enough just to say, I'm sorry. 
it's it, sorry and being sorrowful is part of it, but then you really need to take some action steps. And if uh, you re if you took something, then bring it back, you know, that kind of thing. And so we got, the topic came about reparations and he asked me what I thought about reparations for blacks. So I put the question right back to him. I said, well, what do you think about reparations? <laughs> because I knew that, uh, that the conversation would die if I answered him. And he says, well, I just don't think it's right. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, well, why don't you think it's right? And then he went down to the historical and meritocracy and everybody's worked hard. And I said, well, you're Jewish. And at the end of the war, uh, you, I know that you weren't born yet. So that was past history. Uh, did you know that Germany paid reparations to your tribe, your people? No, he had no idea. And I said, oh, and did you know that when the slaves were freed that the United States government gave reparations to the slave owners for their loss of income and for their loss of property. And he said, no, he had no clue. He had no idea. Mm -hmm. So the, the story that we've been told is, is incomplete. And mm -hmm. how do you change that story? I mean, my friend has a heart of gold. I mean, he's actually my, one of my closest friends who's in my wedding and everything, but he had no clue. He had mm -hmm. no clue of what, things were like and every every day he's surprised mm. and one time we, we'd run a marathon we were in santa barbara we went into a 7-eleven and we both had on our running clothes and our number and everything and lots of sweat and i had salt on from running 26 miles and the proprietor followed me around the store and his eyes were wide open he never he he had read about stuff like that, but he didn't think it really happened. He thought it just happened if, if somebody looks scroungy or something, it was abnormal, it was an anomaly. And so what I usually do when I see that is I just, if they want to follow me, I take them on a journey. If I can run 26 miles, I can do a lot of laps inside the 7-Eleven. <laughs> and I want to say, I'll take them till the sun runs out. <laughs> if that's what he wants to do. I know I shouldn't be confessing that. And I know I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to not do that. <laughs> but uh, there's still a little imp in me that wasn't saved. <laughs> at the same time. But uh, yeah, so reparations are, are interesting. And I, I, I believe that it, it all has to do with the land and the native people. Mm -hmm. uh, my people were like Bob Marley said, stolen from Africa, you know, and everything about my background and heritage. I don't have the stories uh, uh, that, that my Hawaiian brothers and sisters have. I don't know those stories. None of us know those stories. Mm -hmm. We make up stories, but there's a 400 year gap that can't be filled in. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're in a different situation. And I think, uh, the, the people who were affronted first, the native people, probably should be first in line. And then the people who were brought here should be second. And that's hard for people to understand. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and unless we're willing to want what's best for the other, which is one of the, the key doctrines of, or key promises we make at, uh, at Bridging Austin, we, it's not, we want to see the best for the other person. We start there, whatever that best is, we start there. Whoever comes through the door, we want to see the best for them. And we do a lot of work with, as Paul knows, with the disability community. Mm -hmm. And we go in there and what's best for them is to have friends. They don't get anybody from the outside. So we're always trying to find somebody to come in and befriend them. So uh, reparations, I think, are important, at least in, it, it should happen at least as a, uh, is a sign of, mm -hmm. of a contrite heart. Mm -hmm. uh, monetary, I don't know what that would look like or what, but some sort of acknowledgement of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And uh, we have to live into that question. We have to live into that reality. We have to be open and uh, to be stretched. And as uncomfortable as it is, but then we know as we process this together and stay connected, it's not tokenism. And that's always the danger, I think, is that it, it, it just stays at a surface level or as Noel Lani was saying, that it, 
it just Instagram and we've, we've got to make sure I've got to make sure um, I'm being intentional in, in, in accountable uh, to my friends. And on the, on the heels of that, what uh, just one, before we uh, conclude a question that came about is, is how, or what would your um, advice be to, uh, anyone to to your members of your churches as well as those outside the church, uh, how is it that we can attempt to participate in the acts of others, but then also seek to act with them, so that we're not simply participating in those acts, patting ourselves on the back and saying "Yay, look at us," and never truly acting with the person, so that you know if we're talking ontologically, then in one sense you're being with the person, but you're never being in them you know you're being with and not being in the world with them and so how is it that we can take that level of i think pastor jimmy you're talking uh the level of the intimacy you know with uh uh, brotherness and but then the familial and stepping into the the next level of of relationship um so what would be uh each one of you if you could just you know a minute or two to help people how can they so that there isn't tokenism you're not just participating with your black brother or sister or your Hawaiian brother or sister just to feel good about yourself, but you're actually seeking to know them. Mm -hmm. I'd probably go back to my um, days of Trinitarian theology with Dr. Betzger, um, which has just absolutely revolutionized the way I pastor in that Jesus said he only speaks what the Father speaks and, and the Spirit will only speak what I tell him to speak and what the Father says. And, and there is that connectedness um, that manifests in speech, right? So one thing, if I'm just being asked to say one thing I would do differently going forward from here, now that I'm more woke, is that I am trying to think about my speech. I'm trying to think about what I... Um, when I'm developing a message, um, where I can weave these stories in, um, what would my friends who would be impacted um, by what's happening in the news that week, what what could I say into that? And and maybe even checking with, in, in this particular situation, of course, my friend Johnny and um, anyone else that might be impacted by my speech. And mm-hmm. so I think at the very least, I'm, I'm trying to be more careful to um, join with others in what I say and be careful that I don't say things that would hurt other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank, I would, you. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. I would say I was a missionary uh, to Belize, Central America for a little over eight and a half years. and. Uh, one thing I learned is I needed to be a guest in the presence of others. It was my responsibility to be the, to look at myself not as the person who knows it all or the person who brought something uh, that they didn't have. I was a guest in their environment. And uh, at a relational level, uh, my, my partner, Robert Watson Hempel, uh, he, he's a white gentleman and he's successful business person he's got his his degreed up so he's got all of these things going for him and he's he's also a bridge builder and there was a person where he takes his school his uh, kid to school a private school there was a older black gentleman on the porch Robert's become his friend now he doesn't honk his horn and wave they get together Robert already knows his family members. He knows the stories of, of the children, of the sons. And he's been faithful with that guy for five to six years. <laughs> Seeing him once, it, it, it takes a lot of work. And he became a guest in his life. And uh, that required that Robert listen to him because the guy would probably unfriend him <laughs> in a physical way if he felt like he wasn't being listened to. So I, one thing I would say would be it's impossible to make a friend unless you're willing to listen to them. And that's one of the things that uh, coming from the white culture into the black culture is really difficult because they have a hard time listening to what black people have to say because in their mind, uh, their subtle way of thinking they probably have higher level of expertise in most matters. So 
I would say learning to listen. And as Dr. John would say, listen to learn. And you played with Dr. John, right? Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I got my doctorate with him. Yeah. <laughs> we have, thank you, Pastor Jimmy and Pastor Jim. Pastor Jeff, do you have a closing word? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, our, our churches, you wouldn't know if you came there. And nothing against SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention. They were a part of that when I came there, and they were happy I didn't take them out. And I was like, after a couple of years, and I said, I didn't know I could take you out. But anyhow, um, a couple of years ago, SBC did this summer program where they had youth ministries go to different cities. So they wanted to come to Philadelphia. So um, myself and a few other people, we put together um, a curriculum for them to kind of read uh, – certain scriptures, Isaiah, different things, and about just different things around social justice in, in different areas. And so the first week we had a church from the Panhandle of Florida and a church from Kentucky. And I won't say which church, but the majority of the kids never even had physically met a black person before. Yeah. So be, I was still working at a homeless, a Christian homeless shelter at the time. So before I took them to the shelter, we did a class when they first got there. First, we put them in. They were going to stay in a church in the city that had mice, that had shootings going on, on the outside, and they had sleeping bags, and they slept there. Then we did uh, a PowerPoint presentation to show them about the great black migration north and how people had to settle in cities and how projects came about. And we talked about different things. And Sunday, they came to my church and a couple other black churches, and they participated in the worship experience. Then Monday, I was just taking them around the city and taking them to different spots. The whole time, I had a guy who I met in the rescue mission, gave his life to the Lord, and he was still living in the shelter, and he was my helper. And he was hanging, we were eating dinner together and everything. They were so ready to get to the, when are we going to go to the, when are we going to go to the homeless? Let me just take you through the city a little bit. And this guy, I call him John, we get underneath the train station, and I said, you see people laying there? Go lay down on the ground where they're laying at. And they laid there for like 10 minutes and said, okay. Then Robert showed them where he was living at just four months before then. And they were like, whoa, because mm -hmm. we ate with this guy. We worshiped with this guy. We hung out with this guy. He did. He helped us get things. He took us to see the Rocky statue. We didn't know he was homeless four months ago. He lived here. I took him to other places and said, lay there for an hour. Does that feel comfortable? Would you do that on purpose unless you had no other options? And what it did was it prepared their minds and hearts that by the time that they did serve the homeless, they had a compassion and an empathy when they served. Because the flip side of that, I was there for 10 years when I first came there, and I saw a white group coming there in the, in the parking lot. I saw them praying, so I jumped in to pray with them. But they looked at me like they were scared. Yeah. And so I was the education chaplain, so I go into the learning center, I'm sitting in the learning center. An hour later, they're coming through getting a tour. And then the person tells them, the white volunteer director, oh, this is Chaplain Jeff. And they go, oh, like that. And I go, yeah, oh, why the oh? But here was the thing. And I really want you to catch this. In my first class that morning for devotion, I told the guys, this is a great thing. They're coming here to serve. They said, they said Chaplain Jeff, this is the zoo. I said, what do you mean the zoo? They said, do you take your kids to the zoo? I said, yes. They said, you go to see the animals. This is their week to come to the zoo. And that's how they presented themselves to them. And I felt so horrible because Christianity should be helped ministering people to become more human, like God desired. And here we were dehumanizing these mm -hmm. men. So mm -hmm. when I had that group, they saw that. Now, at just six days they were with us. By the end of the week, everybody was crying. They didn't want to go home. Kids are in college now. They Facebook friended me. They send me texts. They ask me for advice and stuff. But not only that, the grown-ups were crying. The grown-ups were crying so bad, and they all said to me, we thought this was going to be some liberal, progressive, social justice mess. Our lives have been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And my life was turned upside down, too, because, mm -hmm. to be honest, I was kind of having my own, like Jimmy was saying, my own, like, yeah, they're going to come and be like whatever, but it was transformative and I wish that we could do more things like that mm. and uh, just walk in other people's shoes and just, and, and the conversations in this. Mm. 
And uh, again, Matt's going to put up on YouTube, I believe, the links to uh, whether Facebook or website so our friends can get connected with uh, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Noelani and Pastor Jim and Pastor Jimmy. And thanks so much, each of you, for your thoughts. We have one more for closing words. Uh, Pastor Jim? Yeah, I was going to say, for um, so in Hawaii, everybody goes to a luau. You, you have a luau, and that becomes the event. But for um, I think for Hawaiians, the, the luau is bigger than just the event itself. And so what you do is you have, um, you have family members. You have um, the aunties um, preparing the meal, and you have the, uh, the keiki, the children, listening to the stories of the, of the aunties and the uncles and and, um, and, you know, you have the pig that goes in the pit late at night and, and the family stands around and drinks beer and tells stories. And there's certain rites of passages during these, you know, the preparation of the luau. And then um, you set up together. You, 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 get, you know, you bring everything together and then you have the event and, and the luau. And then that's for the guests to come and to, to celebrate and have a good time. But during that time, you'll see that the aunties and the uncles are making sure everybody, do you have enough food? Do you have enough this? You don't have enough food, right? Right, Nalani? And All about the food. <laughs> taking care. I mean, just really taking care of the people and making sure they're having a good time. And, and then the luau, you know, the luau event is done. They've had the music and like Nalani shares, it's the best of who we are. It's our food. It's, it's our prayer. It's the fellowship. It's the music. And so that's a real joy. But then, um, and then comes the cleanup. And everybody, everybody cleans up. Everybody that was, you know, set up, you send that you have your guests and then you send it home. And then you have um, uh, uh, the family members and friends said, you know, cleaning up. And, and the reality is, is that nobody leaves alone. Nobody's left alone. Everybody leaves together. And so for me, I think for the church, um, I look at it as a luau, not just the event, but it's the story, it's the preparation, it's, it's talking story, it's sharing stories, sharing our culture. And it's making sure, you know, the real joy is not necessarily eating at the luau. The real joy is watching the faces of the people enjoying it. You know, that, you know, as, as, um, as we see, Jen, or, um, uh, Abraham was told, I will bless you in order that you would be a blessing. And so I think for, uh, for Hawaiians, when you receive well, you give well. And so, you know, we, we see people are enjoying themselves. And then after it's, it is, it's cleaning up, it's doing the messy stuff together, but those are the relationships. And so, I think for me, you know, it's, it's, it's the luau, it's the relationships, it, it, it's the cleaning up together. I think, um, Jimmy, you know, you said it also, it's being a good, it's being a good guest. You know, we're, we're trying to earn the right to be heard in people's lives. And, and so we don't come and say, hey, you know what, this is what you need to do. But it's, it's to say, you know, it's to be a good guest. It's somebody says, you know, can you share more of your story? Um, and then I think, you know, uh, Jimmy was talking about this. In Hawaii, we call this Hawaiian time, right, Nolani? Yeah. That's right. So Hawaiian time. Are we on Hawaiian you know, time? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and really what Hawaiian time is, is that, you know what, relationships are more important than the clock. You don't rush. Yeah. You don't rush. You know what, you don't rush. And so I think those are the, you know, those, I think those, you know, that's the harder part, I think, for non-Indigenous people, is that we're on a clock, we got to get to the next thing. Um, but when we sit among people, um, for Indigenous people, we, that is the main thing. That is the main thing. And so I think for me, it's about the relationships. It's about, you know, working together, struggling together, um, being a good guest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we totally appreciate you, each one of you taking the time. I think uh, when, I, when my family and I were in Scotland, one of the, the things that we were taught with the Scottish was that, the reason why every other door was a pub is because you stopped, you got inside from the cold and you sat with a friend and you talked to them and you found out who they were and you shared life together. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and I, the prayer is, is that uh, the gospel gets so uh, full of the love of Christ that as Pastor Jeffrey was saying is it actually starts to drown out the hate and, and all of these dividing walls so that, we can, as Dr. Metzger said, see one another, not as other than us, but as one with us in solidarity. Let's remove the walls of hostility and indifference that we create and instead live into our new humanity in Christ. We will all be better for it. So thank you so very much to our viewing audience who joined us today. Again, go right on up to the right part portion of your screen and hit like for our Facebook page. That way you're updated with what New Wine is doing for our happenings and events and notifications. 
and then head on over to our YouTube page where this will be posted and below it in the description, you'll be able to see all the beautiful things so that maybe you're not an Eminem fan, but you're, a <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to head over to the and you're going to get music and jump on the coal train <laughs> live because you just jumped into jazz or you're going to jump and see each one of these pastors churches and get some more wisdom because we really do appreciate them hanging out with us so on behalf of pastor jeffrey pastor jim pastor noelani and pastor jimmy as well as dr metzger this is new wine table talks on facebook live we will see you again next thursday 3 p.m same time same bat channel until then we're out. See you on the flip side.